Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us today for this webinar session on the interesting topic of topological photonics. This event is brought to you by the NTU Institute of Advanced Studies, the Graduate Student Clubs of the School of Physical and Mathematical Sciences, the Material Science and Engineering, and the Electrical and Electronics Engineering. My name is Shivam, and I'll be your host for this webinar. Before we begin, there are some housekeeping rules for this webinar. All of your mics have been muted. If you would like to ask question during the Q&A session, please use the raise hand feature at the bottom of your Zoom screen. When your name is called, please ask your question. Or you can post your questions under the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. For the post-grad students who require the endorsement of the attendance, we'll appreciate that your name and affiliation is shown such as my name. That is Shivam and in the brackets, you can write your affiliation. It will help our admin colleagues to keep track of your attendance. Additionally, at the end of the session, do scan the feedback form and indicate the need for endorsement. Now, let's get started. Today's webinar is being organized as a part of the Discovery Science Seminars and Interviews Initiative. Let me introduce the speaker for today's webinar, Prof. Chong Dong. Prof. Vidong received his PhD in physics from MIT, following which he was a postdoctoral researcher at the Yale University. He has received many accolades in his academic career. Recently, he was awarded the prestigious President Science Award along with Professor Nikolai Zeludev and Professor Zhang Baila for their contributions in topological nanophotonics research. Without further ado, let's welcome Prof. Dong. Prof. Dong, please. Yeah, thanks very much for uh, the invitation to give the seminar. Um, uh, so I, I, I uh, realized that this is a a uh, seminar that's geared towards graduate students uh, working in STEM. Uh, so uh, I prepared the, the talk accordingly. Uh, that's it. Uh, I am a physicist and I kind of from, come from a physics background. So some of the stuff that I say will be slightly more uh, geared towards that. So if uh, there's anything that I say that's somehow not uh, quite making sense, or you don't think it's kind of expressed clearly enough uh, or simply enough, uh, don't hesitate to interrupt me. I'll be happy to kind of uh, adjust the level of discussion accordingly. So today's talk is about topological photonics, which is an area of uh, uh, research in which I have been involved essentially almost from the beginning of the that whole field. Uh, so what is topological photonics? First of all, just as a bird's eye view kind of thing, it's in, it can be considered a new subfield of photonics. Uh, so photonics, of course, is the science of manipulating light uh, in all of its aspects, right? So it, I guess, you know, uh, it's kind of, can be regarded as being synonymous with optics, which is, of course, a much older name. Uh, but the idea of photonics is to, uh, is basically the approach to optics that is analogous to how electronics, modern electronics works. So you try to create chips, you try to create uh, devices that guide and flow light uh, in the same way that electronic devices can guide and flow electric currents. So within this gigantic endeavor, which spans physics, electrical engineering, and many other subfields, topological photonics is a new approach uh, that attempts to create and manipulate new types of electromagnetic waves that have uh, a new feature that has not previously been uh, considered before called a topological property. And uh, part of this talk is going to be kind of laying, giving the explanation for what topological property means. Um, so this will be, as you'll see, this is inspired by uh, a whole field of condensed matter physics that is slightly older than topological photonics uh, that is, uh, sometimes given the name of uh, topological insulators. So this is a area, so topological photonics is by now about the 12, of 12 to 15 year old field, depending on 
uh, how you count. So still relatively young. Uh, and I'll kind of give a historical uh, description of this view, that including my own participation in it, and uh, talk a little bit about what people are working on these days. So let's start from the beginning. And in the, in the case of topological photonics, the beginning is this fellow here, Felix Bloch, who was one of the pioneers of uh, taking the newly discovered science of quantum mechanics and trying to use it to explain the properties of solids. So Bloch uh, has a famous theorem which tells you that if you have a crystalline substance, for example, a highly pure sample of aluminum or some other metal or salt or some other insulator like that, uh, and you try to ask what are the, how, how do the quantum states of the electron in this crystalline solid behave, okay? Uh, you will find that because of the properties of uh, translational symmetry breaking, uh, it, it may be very complicated, but it follows certain simple rules. So basically the quantum states are indexed by two numbers, uh, an integer n and a Con, uh, basically a vector called K, which is a wave vector. So unlike a plane wave in free space, the presence of a crystal means that uh, uh, electrons, when they propagate through the crystal, they don't behave quite like plane waves. Instead, they undergo diffraction. And this diffraction takes the energy levels that exist within the solid, and it breaks them up into what you can see here, breaks them up into discrete bands, right? So each of these curves here in this, uh, is, uh, is a so-called band, and the vertical axis is the energy, the horizontal axis is, looks complicated, but it's basically uh, something that represents this wave vector K. And basically these bands occupy discrete ranges of energy. So for example, this band here that's labeled L3 uh, prime, uh, only extends in energy from uh, this level to that level, okay? So there's a bunch of discrete bands, and uh, so it may occur that uh, if the Fermi level, which is you, basically you have electrons, they're fermions, they fill, you, they fill up all the available quantum states up to some level, the Fermi level. And if this Fermi level lies in a band gap, the material is an insulator, otherwise it is a metal, okay? And, uh, currents can flow freely through a partially filled band. So uh, this, of course, ignores interactions. Uh, so the, one of the great discoveries of uh, solid state physics that uh, this single particle picture, which essentially ignores the electrostatic interaction between electrons, is actually able to give an extremely good account for how actual materials behave uh, and it's kind of a long story beyond the scope of this talk, why this might be. So solid state physicists over the course of the 50s, 60s, 70s, uh, kind of built on this to kind of uh, build up increasingly sophisticated and accurate uh, theories of uh, electronic properties of solids. However, there was, uh, and, 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 so, sorry, um, and uh, during the 80s, something interesting happened, which is that the people working on the nascent field of photonics, uh, well, specifically two gentlemen, uh, Sajiv John and Eli Yablonovich in 1987, independently came up with an idea, which is that Bloch's theorem is a theorem that, that uh, describes waves that are propagating in, periodic, in a periodic background. In the case of uh, uh, a material, uh, this is basically the periodic background that's produced by the atomic ions, right? The ionic cores of the atoms. And when the electron sees, uh, 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 flows through this material, it sees this periodic lattice of ions. But when you have light, it is possible to structure the light, uh, structure the medium in which the light flows. So for example, let's say you have uh, layers of uh, high 
and low dielectric constant materials and you stack them up periodically. Or you can do a two-dimensional uh, uh, lattice in which you have some kind of checkerboard pattern of high and low uh, dielectric constant materials. Or you could do this even in 3D with a 3D grid. If you were able to fabricate a so-called photonic crystal in such a way, uh, then when light flows through the photonic crystal, it would be subject to Bloch's theorem and a photonic band gap would occur. In the, specifically, that if you, it, it might be that if you engineer this thing carefully enough, you will find, as is shown here, that there's some range of frequencies in which light would not be able to flow within this photonic crystal. This is what's called a photonic band gap, right? Uh, so the one-dimensional version of a photonic crystal uh, is just a grating, a Bragg grating, which considerably uh, predates the idea of the photonic crystal as formulated by Sajib John and Eli Yablonovich. Uh, nonetheless, these authors uh, were able to provide a con conceptual framework in which to think beyond the one-dimensional case to, for example, two-dimensional photonic crystals and three-dimensional photonic crystals. Uh, and this would provide a way to, for example, trap light, right? So if uh, light is not able to pro propagate within the photonic crystal at a certain range of frequencies, it would basically be a way of creating a highly efficient mirror. Uh, so uh, compared to Condensed matter physics, uh, there are lots of similarities. The basic idea is the same. Uh, however, there are some striking differences as well. For example, there's no Fermi level. So we don't have a concept of a uh, conductance. So you cannot measure the resistance per se of a photonic crystal, uh, the way that you can measure the electrical resistance of a metal or an insulator. Uh, and there's no interaction effects. Photons basically don't interact with each other at all. So a lot of the kind of complicated theories that physicists came up with to explain why you can ignore interparticle interactions in the electronic case are irrelevant. Uh, so also there's no spin and also importantly, the thermal effects are negligible. So for many complicated electronic phenomena that physicists have studied over the years, you need to cool down the temperature to nearly absolute zero. Uh, but basically for light, thermal, uh, the, 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 the relevant thermal scale is irrelevant. So uh, we don't have to consider temperature. Everything can be done at room temperature. So after the, uh, the uh, invention of the photonic crystal in 1987, uh, throughout the 1990s and early 2000s, uh, physicists uh, were uh, involved in basically refining this idea. For example, just because you could, in principle, create a photonic bank gap uh, doesn't mean that you know how to do it. So basically, people came up with various schemes for creating different sorts of photonic crystals that are able to open complete gaps in 2D or 3D. Uh, people also started exploring uh, the applications of these photonic crystals. For example, people came up with photonic crystal fibers, uh, which basically are a way to uh, use photonic crystals and bed them in the uh, optical fiber in order to create uh, an optical fiber that can uh, carry light with extremely high efficiency, extremely low leakage. Okay. Uh, but a lot of the uh, resistance to photonic crystals also was sociological, right? So uh, actually convincing, you know, so for example, the physicists that started working on this had a hard time convincing people that this is still physics. So one of the, uh, uh, my mentors, John Jonopoulos, uh, started out in condensed matter theory as well, as indeed, by the way, did Sajib John and Eli Yablonovich. And uh, when he started doing a lot of research in the late 1990s about uh, uh, methods for fabricating better photonic crystals. People were going around saying, hey, have you heard that John has, has left physics? You know, all he's doing is just studying the properties of these dielectric pillars. He's not doing physics anymore. Well, nowadays, luckily, uh, that, that's no longer the attitude that most physicists have, as you'll see. Uh, it turns out that photonic crystals are very much a mainstream of uh, physics research nowadays. 
so John, uh, who we will see again later in the story, uh, was also one of the uh, key people involved in the development of photonic crystal fibers, uh, for example, for medical endoscopy. And he wrote a great textbook, uh, Photonic Crystals Molding the Flow of Light, which is still one of the definitive textbooks for this whole field. Now, so we haven't even started talking about topological stuff now. Uh, and let me uh, go into this at this point. So topological uh, insulators arose in the 1980s. Uh, and the basic idea of this is that, you know, it sounds from uh, what I've said before that you just, all you need is Bloch's theorem. Once you have Bloch's theorem, you figure out what the bands, and then depending on where the Fermi level is, you either have a conductor or an insulator. And all conductors more or less behave the same with minor details. All insulators more or less behave the same. Uh, now, an amazing discovery, which was made in 1980 uh, by... Uh, uh, Klaus von Klitzing and collaborators is that this story is very much incomplete. Not all insulators are created equal. Some are more equal than others. So in 1980, uh, von Klitzing was doing experiments on what's called a two-dimensional electron gas, which is basically a semiconductor heterojunction. Uh, basically between the P and N layers of heterojunction, you can create a region uh, in which electrons can flow within a two-dimensional plane. And he was studying what happens to this so-called two-dimensional electron gas at extremely low temperatures close to absolute zero and in a very strong magnetic field. In basically this configuration, you have a two-dimensional electron gas, you apply a perpendicular magnetic field, and you pass a current through it and measure the transverse rather than longitudinal voltage, the so-called Hall voltage. And what he found was something amazing that the whole, con the whole resistance exhibits these plateaus, okay? And if you look at it in terms of conductance rather than resistance, so you take one over the whole resistance, you find that they are quantized to integer multiples of E squared over H, okay? And not only is it quantized, but the actual numerical values uh, are accurate to one part in 10 to the 9, which is amazing if you think about it, because E and H are fundamental constants of the universe, right? Uh, and yet here you have some kind of a solid state sample, extreme levels of impurities, uh, it's a macroscopic object, and yet when you perform this measurement of the whole conductance, uh, you get something that is integer multiple of this particular combination of fundamental constants. E squared over H, why would this, pos how could this possibly be? Uh, and the exploration of this story basically led to a couple of Nobel Prizes, uh, in 91 in 1995 to von Klitzing for the discovery of the integer quantum hold effect, uh, and later in 1998 for the discovery of a follow-on phenomenon called a fractional quantum hold effect, which I won't talk about. So what explains the uh, extremely accurate quantization of the quantum hole conductance. Uh, so this is where theories started coming into the picture. And this gave rise to basically a lot of extremely pretty uh, theoretical physics, which the consequences of which uh, we are still exploring to this day. In 1982, uh, David Taulis, uh, another future Nobel laureate and his co-workers gave an explanation for the quantum hole effect uh, that was basically, that evoked the idea that the quantum hole conductance is tied to what's called a topological invariant of the electronic bands. What is a topological invariant? Uh, basically, it is a concept that comes from uh, mathematics, so basically, if you have a shape and you're allowed to twist and deform the shape, uh, but you are not allowed to uh, tear it, okay? So for example, if you have a, a sphere, you can deform the sphere into various other shapes, uh, but it always has the topological class of a sphere, whereas with a donut, you can deform it into various things, including a teacup, 
uh, but you're not able to deform a, 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 a torus or, a, or uh, into a sphere. So the sphere and the torus are said to have two different topological invariants, which can be classified essentially by the number of holes that pass through it. Something called a genus, which is an integer. So ignore all the math here, but basically Taldus and co-workers figured out a way of assigning what is essentially the number of holes, a topological invariant to the quantum mechanical description of an electronic band. So if you have band structure, you can assign to each band a bunch of integers. Okay, sorry, to each band an integer, which is called the churn number or the TKNN number after this authors. Uh, and in the normal insulator, the churn number is zero. But uh, what can happen is that uh, you can rearrange the material and then you can, uh, if you're clever enough, you can create a material in which certain bands have churn numbers that are non-zero and then they must be integers. So for example, one and minus one rather than zero. And what they were able to show is that uh, if a material, if somehow you were able to create a material that has non-zero churn numbers, then it would also have quantized Hall conductances. Uh, this part of the analysis, I have, there's no way for me to go through it right now, uh, but basically it arises from something called the linear response calculation. Basically it's a quantum mechanical calculation, okay? So in normal materials, all the insulators and all the metals that people have studied to date, this has been what are so-called trivial insulators, meaning the churn numbers are all zero. But the quantum hole uh, gas, if you regard this as a, uh, a, band, a band system, okay, it is the first instance of what's called a topological insulator, uh, uh, something in which the bands have non-zero churn numbers. Uh, just one note, uh, this, uh, there's a mathematical uh, theorem that shows that uh, you can only have non-zero churn numbers if you break time reversal symmetry, meaning in practical terms that you're applying a magnetic field to the material. So uh, just following on this idea of uh, band topology, uh, if you have two different materials, and one is a topological insulator and one's a conventional insulator, okay, topological insulator that has non-zero churn numbers is also called a churn insulator, and you put them next to each other, then uh, just as you cannot deform a donut into a sphere, uh, likewise, you cannot uh, smoothly deform the band structure of a conventional insulator to a topological insulator. So something funny must happen at the physical interface between them. And it turns out that what happens is that there are currents that flow along this uh, surface. So just say, suppose you have a range of energies in which the conventional insulator has a gap in the bulk of the material and the churn insulator has a gap in the bulk of the material. Nonetheless, within this energy range, the so-called band gap, uh, there do exist quantum states that flow along the surface, okay? And these are the so-called topological H states. The existence is guaranteed by the topological invariance. Now, uh, so hang on to that thought. So all this is only scratching the surface of the quantum Hall effect. It turns out that there's loads of other cool stuff. Uh, people were busy throughout the 1980s, 1990s, early 2000s, expanding this concept of, uh, of the band topology and analysis of the quantum Hall effect in various ways that I have no way of covering within this talk, okay? Uh, for example, in 2005, people came up with uh, materials in which you don't have to apply a magnetic field Okay, it's a 2D material, but intrinsically, it is still functions as a topological insulator uh, based on the new kind of topological invariant that's slightly different from the churn insulator. And people also figure out how to create three-dimensional materials that have this topological insulator properties. Okay, so now, uh, so this is where people were at in the early 2000s. Now, in... Uh, 2005, uh, one of the uh, theoretical physicists had, that had contributed the most to the concept of topological insulators in condensed matter physics, uh, Duncan Haldane, the gentleman pictured here, 
uh, had this idea. Uh, he had listened to actually a talk by uh, John Janopoulos, the MIT professor who had uh, been working on photonic crystals and people thought he had left physics. Okay, anyway, he gave to, went to Princeton, gave a talk. And after that, Duncan Haldane, uh, heard this, having heard this talk about photonic crystals, started thinking, well, if uh, you can create an insulator for light, which is a photonic crystal, then can you create a topological insulator for light? Because he was very familiar with the concept of topological insulators. He had spent a lot of time working on it. Uh, with his graduate student, Srimanas Raghu, he wrote a paper that basically argued that you can uh, do such a thing. Okay. Uh, what you need is to take a photonic crystal and you have to break time reversal symmetry in some way. And they realized that the equivalent of breaking time reversal symmetry, which could be accomplished in condensed matter physics by applying a magnetic field. In the context of, a, of a photonics, you do this by using certain types of materials called magneto-optic materials, which are basically materials that uh, uh, change properties when a magnetic field is applied to it. Okay. So if somebody raised their hand, uh, uh, I'm free to, uh, if you want to take a quick question. No? Okay, uh, it's fine. I, 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 uh, feel free to interject with a question if you want, or uh, if you want to, you can, you can, you can uh, take the question later. I can't see the chat right now, okay? Anyway. Uh, so they figured out that you just you need what are so-called magneto-optic materials. Uh, they didn't say what kind of magneto-optic materials you could use. Uh, they did recognize that there's no such thing as a Fermi level. So you cannot have such a thing as a quantized whole conductance because there's no concept of conductance for light. Uh, however, they said that the main thing that you could see if you were to create this system would be that uh, uh, the topological H states you would see H states that flow in one direction along the surface of this two-dimensional photonic crystal, which would be kind of cool. And that was the title of the, uh, of the, uh, uh, the, the paper, One-Way Waveguides, Analogs of Quantum Hall H states in Photonic Crystals. Uh, there was a paper, by the way, by three Japanese chaps who kind of uh, got round to something similar, uh, similar set of concepts at around the same time. Now, Haldane and Raghu posted their paper to the archive in 2005, uh, whereupon it languished for about three years without seeing the light of day in the journal. One of the reasons for this, uh, I think, uh, is that they wrote this paper in kind of an impenetrable style, such that uh, if you were a condensed matter theorist, you kind of understood the theoretical concepts that they were talking about, uh, but you had no idea what the... Uh, uh, this optic stuff was. And if you were a guy from photonics, you have no idea what this fancy theoretical physics they were going on about was at all, because it was really written in quite of a insightful, but ultimately impenetrable way. So uh, luckily there were a few of us who kind of had the background to kind of understand the uh, importance of this. Okay, so I was a graduate student at MIT uh, I joined in 2005 uh, with the group of uh, Marin Soljacic, who was uh, working very closely with John Johnopoulos. He had previously been John's uh, uh, graduate student. Uh, both John Johnopoulos and Marin Soljacic were uh, condensed matter physicists by training who had moved into, into, uh, uh, into photonics. Uh, I myself also had a background in condensed matter physics. And that's what I did my research on as an undergraduate, uh, the, basically a quantum Hall effect. Uh, and also, you know, and basically I wanted to do some research and then Marit had a opening in his group. And so I said, yeah, whatever, I'll join, I'll do photonics, whatever. So I, I kind of joined his group. So we had a bunch of us uh, and Zeng Wang was a uh, postdoc at the time who was uh, working with Marit and John. So all of us kind of were condensed matter background people and we kind of knew a little of that and we knew a little bit about photonics. Uh, and we uh, basically, I read Haldane's paper and kind of pointed it out to Zheng and said, well, you know, there's this crazy proposal. He needs uh, magnetic fields that are pretty strong. Uh, it's not obvious that this could, this could uh, be done. 
right? But you know, if you do this, you you know, you do a you do a simulation, you see that this light waves can actually flow pretty well uh, in, in one direction along this new kind of one-way wave guide. And Zeng basically uh, had the idea that, well, you can actually build this, right? Uh, and he had the practical knowledge that uh, you don't necessarily need to do photonics at the optical frequencies where magneto-optic effects tend to be weak. Uh, instead, you can go drop down to microwave frequencies uh, in which you can have a strong time reversal symmetry breaking using what are called magnetic ferrites. And these are basically things that are used in these devices called magnetic circulators. Uh, they are things like yttrium iron garnet. And if you add a, for example, 0.2 Tesla magnetic field and you operate it at around 4.5 gigahertz, then the frequency dependent permeability will have this tensor form and the odd diagonal terms will be on order 10 and the imaginary off diagonal terms of the permeability tensor, which signify how strong the uh, magneto optic uh, effect is, is also on order 10. So this thing is a, what, as strong a magneto optic uh, material as you could possibly ask for. Uh, based on this, uh, we put together some uh, simulations uh, and uh, band structure calculations. Uh, which basically showed that you can indeed create practical photonic crystals, not at optical frequencies, but at, at microwave frequencies, gigahertz frequencies, right? Rather than 10 to the 12 hertz. Uh, and, uh, and then you could create bands that have non-zero churn numbers. If you inject light, it flows along the surface. Uh, and because it's a one-way waveguide, you put an obstacle around uh, like a metal plate there's no way for it to back reflect, but it has to flow around. So this is the output of a COMSOL calculation uh, done in 2006 or 2007, uh, showing that this, this, this thing really functioned in quite an amazing way that normally if you to take a, a ordinary optical or microwave waveguide, you put a barrier like this, it would just reflect rather than flowing around. So we wrote a theory paper on this, which was published in 2008. And immediately uh, we said, well, we, we should do this because uh, unlike uh, photonic crystal experiments that are done at optical frequencies, which really you need a full-blown lab, uh, fabrication facilities and so forth. Here we are, we are talking about a tabletop experiment. This uh, photonic crystal, since you're operating at four gigahertz, the wavelength is on centimeter scales. And so you're talking about things like uh, cylinders of uh, yttrium eye garnet that you can hold in your fingers. So we can order this from a supplier, put them together in the experiment, actually do the experiment, right? So this four of us, we were all theorists, but we felt confident enough, well, especially since this thing was supposed to immune to this order, right? That we could get the experiment to work, even if we uh, uh, had to spend some time on it. Uh, so anyway, to cut a long story short, we borrowed uh, somebody else's lab. Uh, this was a a giant magnet that was in a lab that usually did a particle physics experiment. This is a state-of-the-art cyclotron circa 1950 that was still lying around uh, being used for demonstration experiments. Uh, the reason we needed a giant magnet was not necessarily because we had uh, uh, we needed a giant magnetic field. We used 0.2 Tesla but rather because the experiment was a tabletop experiment. So we needed to take this whole microwave photonic crystal, which is about one meter by one meter. And if we need a magnet big enough that we can apply a magnetic field right through it to magnetize the yttrium iron garnet rod. Uh, here's a picture, photograph of the experiment. And if we inject light, it kind of flows around. This is a simulation. And then this is on the right here is the uh, the uh, experimental results showing robust transmission to various sorts of obstacles. And we managed to get this published in Nature in 2009. Uh, so let me go a little bit more quickly. Uh, so there were a few, so, so this drew a lot of attention, but uh, immediately it was clear that this was a very special kind of design. You needed a giant magnet. Uh, it operates at microwave frequencies. If you take the same materials, you trim iron garnet and try to work them at optical frequencies, the magneto-optic 
uh, effect is just way too weak. It goes from 10 to like 10 to the minus three. Uh, so the question is, could you use dielectrics to do this? Uh, to cut a long story short, in the subsequent years, uh, people figured out various ways of doing this. Uh, Mohammed Hafezi, who, uh, uh, who was then a, a, a postdoc in uh, Harvard and later on moved to University of Maryland, uh, figured out that one way of doing it was to take this coupled optical ring resonators. Uh, you put in this uh, asymmetric couplers in between them, okay, such that the phase going from left to right and right to left uh, is different. It just bas because basically because the path length is different. So this thing from the point of view of a tight binding description looks a lot like having a magnetic field. Okay, uh, The only downside is that basically you have to look only at light that circulates in one direction, let's say clockwise or anti-clockwise uh, along the resonator. So if you, for example, if you look at only anti-clockwise modes uh, and you see how this anti-clockwise mode hops from one side to another side and you only stick to those modes, anti-clockwise modes, it looks like you have a magnetic field present. But actually what happens is that since you have, uh, since time reversal symmetry is ultimately unbroken, so you actually have two copies of this. So the anti-clockwise modes uh, behave like they have one magnetic field. The clockwise modes behave like they're subject to an opposite magnetic field, okay? Uh, but if you only look at one sector at a time, uh, this thing maps on the equations map onto the quantum Hall lattice. And then they did an experiment showing that this is indeed the case. This is the uh, fluorescent imaging showing the propagation of topological edge states in a uh, infrared frequency uh, a lattice of a, 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 a lattice of a couple ring resonators. Uh, and uh, the group of Moti Sagev and Alexander Samait figured out a different way of doing this, which is basically based on taking couple optical waveguides. And then if you let the waveguides uh, have the shape that's like a helix, uh, this is from the point of view of the photons moving down the waveguide, it looks as though because of the helical motion, it looks as though you're being stirred which is like breaking time reversal symmetry, okay? So this stirring motion also is able to create a photonic uh, topological insulator. Uh, by the way, so this was around the time, so I had by this time graduated MIT. Uh, I was working on other stuff uh, uh, at, at Yale uh, involving, for example, non-permission photonics. Uh, around 2012, 2013, I came back to NTU to start a group and started getting back into topological photonics, which I had worked on as a graduate student. So uh, one of the first postdocs that I got, uh, uh, Dr. Liang Guanxuan, uh, I told him to start doing, uh, you know, ex, you know so just replicate the Hafezi experiment, uh, or rather the Hafezi proposal. The experiment was not done at the time yet. So he started doing this FTDD simulations, and he found something interesting, which is that you don't actually need this asymmetric couplings. Uh, actually, even if it's symmetric couplings uh, in this uh, couple of uh, resonator lattice, you can still create topological edge states. Uh, this, was, this puzzled me for a long time uh, because it seems like you could get a free lunch, but it turned out that uh, this was the example of something called anomalous Floquet TI, which was a new kind of topological uh, insulator that could support topological edge states uh, despite having zero churn numbers. Uh, so this was my first, uh, well, one of my first uh, experiences in coming across a really a completely new kind of uh, topological insulator uh, that could be realized in photonics uh, that had not really been explored in the literature at all. Uh, by the way, the, at around this time, I started collaborating with uh, Zhang Bai Le, uh, uh, experimenter, this colleague, uh, who really started getting interested in topological photonics. Uh, so we, we, we realized this proposal. Uh, it, it got this published in Nature Communications uh, uh, a few years later. Uh, using a basically a microwave experiment using what are called spool surface plasmons. So just taking stock, uh, around 2015, we had various people had uh, found ways to demonstrate topological edge states uh, in a range of uh, two-dimensional platforms. Uh, 
so there was this intriguing, uh, you know, uh, use of it as a one-way waveguide that's immune to disorder. Uh, however, it should be noted that the later all dielectric implementations that don't actually have a real physical magnetic field, uh, this, this, this things are not really one-way waveguides, basically because you're only looking at one sector at a time. You don't actually break what's called optical reciprocity. Okay. Uh, so you can access topological phases that condensed matter physics cannot, or it maybe even hasn't even predicted. Uh, and you can introduce some extra physical phenomena. You'll see that talk about this later, uh, which are absent or irrelevant in condensed matter physics. So what could you, how could you extend this story? Well, you could try to come up with new platforms, uh, you know, more compact platforms. Uh, instead of looking at light, you could look at other stuff like sound waves or go to 3D. Uh, as for applications, maybe I'll talk about that later. This is anyway, the, end of the, the, the short story is that we are still waiting on a real killer app for this area of uh, research, okay? Uh, but you could, you having discovered a few topological phases in photonics that were uh, unexpected, maybe you could try to look for others. And this has been a really fruitful area of research. Uh, and another fruitful area of research is to try to take this topological photonics and couple it to stuff uh, like uh, optical nonlinearity that doesn't exist in the condensed matter context. So let me kind of very quickly rush through uh, a few examples of each that people have done in the subsequent years since 2015. Uh, so first of all, people have found ways to use photonic crystals to uh, achieve topological edge states. So even though, for example, I have talked about here, uh, like uh, this thing, uh, this, here we have like uh, uh, optical resonator lattice. These are not photonic crystals in the usual sense because the periodicity is much larger than the wavelength of light. Okay, these are actually, the, the resonators are large. Each resonator is large compared to the wavelength of light. So the light can flow, maybe they'll have like 10 path lengths around each round trip, around each resonator. And then uh, each, each lattice is much bigger than that. Uh, so, but people figure out a way to do this with uh, photonic crystals where you really have, you don't, you, it's very compact, the periodicity on the wavelength of light. There are two ways of doing this. One is called a so-called topological crystalline insulator. The other is a so, what's called a valley photonic crystal. Uh, so these things can support robust uh, edge states that can do amazing things. Like for example, in the valley photonic crystal, it can flow around this 120 degree sharp corner rather than reflecting, okay? So it's somewhat weaker topological protection than the full-fledged churn insulator photonic crystal, but uh, it's still possibly useful for various things. Uh, by the way, the first uh, demonstration of the valley photonic crystal for topological edge states was again done by uh, Zhang Beiler uh, in the Nature of Physics paper published in 2017. This was done in collaboration with uh, uh, Gennady Schmetz from Cornell. Uh, people have been very active in pushing this idea from light into uh, acoustics and electronics, including us. Okay, so uh, the, basically the first uh, paper that basically pointed out, well, if you could create topological photonics, why don't you have topological acoustics doing this with sound waves? Uh, this was a paper that I published with uh, Myler in 2015. This has been cited a gazillion times uh, and it's led on to uh, basically a whole new field where people use uh, acoustic structures which it turns out is often cheaper, easier to fabricate. Uh, so it can be used for rapid prototyping of ideas in the, the uh, uh, topological band uh, uh, theory uh, to realize. It's often easier to realize with things with acoustics rather than even with microwave experiments. Uh, a separate community has started coming up with topological mechanics. Uh, people, including us, have explored topological electronics, uh, basically by using electric circuits to carry this, uh, the, this uh, uh, so, so unlike a, yeah, it's, it's using classical electric circuits to carry this topological edge states. For example, by the way, uh, 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 last year we published a paper that showed that with electronics, you can have the flexibility to explore high spatial dimensions because you're not, uh, the lattice doesn't be coupled tightly to physical space by uh, putting the right connections between the right 
places on the circuit, you can create something that's effectively four-dimensional. So you can create something called a four-dimensional topological insulator, which is kind of conceptually cool. Uh, so people have uh, explored the three-dimensional case as well. Uh, again, uh, this is something I can't say a lot about. Uh, so except that this, uh, first of all, in three dimensions, the interesting topological phases are not only topological insulators. It turns out that you can have what are called topological semi-metals, which are things that don't have a bad gap, uh, but still have some topological properties and interesting surface physics associated with them. Uh, this was pioneered by uh, Ling Lu, who was then a uh, postdoc uh, working in my, uh, with my old boss, Marin Seljacic. So the MIT group, after I left, uh, came out of this uh, whole area of uh, uh, topological bio uh, uh, photonic crystals. Uh, by the way, this was around the time that bio semimetals first started coming on the scene. And the first experimental demonstration of bio semimetals was simultaneously in photonics and using traditional condensed matter context. So this gave it, gives an idea of uh, the uh, increasing importance of uh, photonics and other cl uh, uh, classical wave systems for realizing ideas in band topology. Uh, later on, I, I, I collaborated with uh, Mikhail Rexman, uh, who, who, had, uh, uh, who we have seen before. Uh, to realize the, the second type of a second type of bio point that you can uh, that is hypothetically possible, and this was the first realization of a, a photonic bio point at optical frequencies, and this was done again with a certain kind of helical waveguide lattice. This work was uh, led by uh, Daniel Lakem, who was a postdoc at NTU uh, from uh, 2015 to around 2018, and, and did a lot of stuff uh, uh, while in my group. Uh, so the first three-dimensional topological insulator was uh, done uh, also here in NTU uh, by uh, Ihao Yang, who some of you in the audience probably know. He was a very talented and productive postdoc uh, in uh, first in uh, Ranjan's group, Ranjan Singh's group, and later uh, he moved to Chan uh, Pailas group. Uh, so he really pioneered this uh, whole approach of using Fourier probes to really, you map out the electromagnetic or acoustic response everywhere inside the structure, and then you do a Fourier decomposition. And this allows you to map out a, the full band structure of a, a system, and you can match the uh, experimental band structure to the predicted band structure, show that the gap, band gap is exactly in the right place. You can even image out the, uh, the uh, uh, topological edge states, as he did here, for this three-dimensional uh, so-called weak 3D topological insulator. This was published in Nature in 2019. Uh, again, this was at, done at, optical, uh, at microwave frequencies using uh, specially designed resonators that are embedded in uh, PCBs, printed circuit boards, which are then stacked to form a three-dimensional structure. Uh, higher order topological insulators, I won't have time to talk about this because time is running out. Basically a new form of topological phase that people really started getting into uh, the first, uh, one of the first realizations, uh, sorry, the first realization of this idea now is entirely photonics, right? So people came up with the, the photonics realization of this. So that done by Mikhail Rexman in 2018, way before any other condensed matter realizations. Uh, we also, there was also a second type of uh, HOTI that uh, we use acoustics to realize this in Pilot's group in 2019. Uh, Non-Hermitian topological photonics is another uh, thing that people are actively exploring, including us, which is basically uh, the idea that, well, you can add gain or loss. So it turns out that the traditional theory of band topology inherited from condensed matter physics assumes that energy is conserved, but for electromagnetic waves, energy is not necessarily conserved since you can add energy by uh, doing a stimulated emission as in the laser, or you can extract energy by adding ohmic losses, for example. So we have, when you have non-Hermitian effects, you, this can give rise to topological uh, states that are completely of a different category from the topological bands that you're familiar with from the Hermitian context. So it's like a new universe of uh, topological 
phases that people are only now really starting to actively explore. And really the motivation of this is topological photonics uh, because you would never have thought about including this phenomena at all if you had just stuck to condensed matter physics because there's no such thing as gain in condensed matter physics uh, in, in a tri in standard sense. So it brings us to topological lasers. Uh, this is, uh, these lasers are not old lasers. So, so basically once you have a topological uh, photonic topological insulator, you might say, well, what kinds of photonic devices could we make from this? And the laser, of course, is the big and important class of photonic devices. They're important in all walks of life. Uh, so it took a while for people to figure out how to do this, uh, including the technical challenges and also the conceptual theoretical challenges, basically because uh, standard band theory assumes that the system is linear, the system is Hermitian, energy is conserved, as I said, uh, but lasers break both of these uh, rules. Uh, they uh, have gain uh, and they have gain saturation, which is a non-linear effect. Uh, they are leaky, so stuff leaks out. So, it's, 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 so it took some time for us uh, to uh, kind of get uh, our minds around how to describe this theoretically, but uh, very quickly there, was, uh, there were a few papers that first on 1D, but then in two dimensions, realized topological lasing. Uh, and then later, uh, last year, uh, uh, we had a paper in Nature that uh, basically demonstrated electrically pumped topological lasers using this Valley Hall photonic crystal uh, design. This was done in collaboration with the group of uh, Wang Qijie in electrical engineering, who's very much an expert in uh, quantum cascade lasers, which are uh, lasers that can laser at the mid infrared to terahertz regime. So, we made use of his expertise to fabricate this uh, 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 quantum cascade laser that has this design that's set up to be a valley hole photonic topological insulator. And uh, simulations show that the lasing modes flow around this triangular cavity uh, without abrupt reflection. So when it flows around, it hits a sharp 120 degree corner, it can keep going and it can create this weird whispering gallery like modes with equal frequency spacings. Even though normally if you have a whispering gallery mode, you need to have a very smooth uh, path. But here is a very sharp corner. There's, there's a triangular cavity. Nonetheless, you have whispering gallery-like emission patterns, uh, completely different from what you would get if you try to construct a triangular cavity using a non-topological design. So anyway, so this kind of brings me to uh, the state of the art. It seems like there's still a lot of stuff to explore. Uh, one of the things, and I'll be happy to kind of have a discussion about this during the follow-up Q&A. Uh, one of the things that we are still very much waiting for is the killer app. So uh, we are very, very hopeful about this topological laser, okay? Uh, where Because this gives us a way to create uh, lasers where you can actually engineer the spectral properties uh, in, you know, very robustly, no matter how you kind of play around with fabrication defects, this thing still has evenly spaced laser modes. Uh, and it's electrically pumped, it's kind of ready to be a device as soon as we can figure out why, why we would want to have uh, this kind of functionality. Uh, if uh, topological, if this or other topological laser-like uh, applications were to turn out to bear fruit, then actually this would possibly be the first practical technological application of the whole idea of topological insulators in physics. Because on the condensed matter side, people have said, well, topological insulators might be used for these various things, including spectronic devices. But there again, you see that this is not really reached to the point of getting to a practical technology. And it might be if on the photonic side that we might be able to beat them to having a practical application for topological bands, but photonic bands rather than electronic bands. Okay, so just a quick note, uh, this has been a rapid survey. So there's a bunch of people and interesting work that I've not had the time to 
discuss. I'm over time already, so apologies for that. And I would really like to express my gratitude for the great people that I have been able to collaborate with over the years, including uh, the MIT group where this all began. Uh, that's me 10 years ago, Marin Soliatrish, John Janopoulos, and Zheng Wang, uh, as well as my uh, collaborators both outside uh, NTU, uh, Mikhail Rexman, uh, Mohammed Hafezi, and in NTU, Zhang Pailer and Wang Qijie, and the various students and postdocs that I've had the chance to work with over the years. Thank you very much, and I'll be happy to take questions. Uh, thank you, Prof. Yidong, for such an insightful talk. Now, I would like to invite our co-host, Ernest, from the School of Material Science and Engineering, and Aditi from the School of Electrical and Electronic Engineering to host the Q&A session. Thank you. Okay, hi, Prof. Chong. Yeah, okay, I hope they can hear me. Yeah, so, uh, all right, so... Before we begin with the Q&A session, there are some interview questions that both the Triple E Graduate Student Club and the MSC Graduate Student Club have come up with. So before we are the MSC Student Club begin, I would like to invite Aditi to uh, interview you some questions regarding from the Triple E uh, Student Club. So Aditi, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, hi. Yeah. Hi. Uh, yeah, Professor. So the first question we have is, uh, what are the advantages does electrically driven topological uh, laser have over topological lasers which were being used initially? Right. So uh, basically every, almost, well, almost every laser that uh, you use in real life is an electrically driven laser. So if you have a laser pointer, that's an electrically driven laser of a sort known as a vixel, vertically cap, you know, um, vertical cavity uh, emitting surface emitting laser. Um, the lasers that you have in your PS4 or your, you know, uh, whatever has as an optical drive in your mouse, those those are all electrically driven lasers. Um, so anything that, so so it's not that optically pumped lasers are useless, yeah, but usually they are big, bulky. Uh, they are not uh, package devices. Uh, they usually are used in things like uh, industrial environments and uh, scientific labs where space is not an issue. But anything that once get turned into a, a compact device has to be electrically driven. Uh, also for certain types of lasers, uh, like this quantum cascade lasers, which are the, you know, this was the first demonstration of a topological laser in the uh, terahertz regime. So for those, they have to be electrically driven. You, there, there, there's no practical way to uh, uh, do optical driving. Uh, so to that, that, that's basically the, the, the short answer to that. Thank you. Uh, and then we ha also have another question. Um, like, what are the advancements in nanofabrication uh, we have to take care for topological protection and precise control of the photons in nanoscale? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so, it really depends on what kind of device or, or, or structure you're trying to create. So, for the um, some of Certain types of photonic topological insulators, for example, this couple optical resonator lattices, uh, which were pioneered by uh, Mohammed Hafezi, the chap over here, uh, which were also, by the way, used in the first optically pumped two-dimensional topological laser. They also used this design. These are big systems. Uh, so you, all you need is you will fabricate these rings and couple them. Uh, so the the it, you don't need that state-of-the-art fabrication, frankly. Uh, all you need, of course, the more, uh, the better your fabrication is, the less light you lose to out-of-plane scattering. So let's say your light is propagating along this optical chip. If you have a defect that is uh, some kind of a minor scattering defect, you can, uh, you can scatter out of plane. And this is something that's not protected against by the topological principles, right? 
so your losses, uh, you, the, 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 less lo the, the, the better your fabrication, the less loss you have. This is something, by the way, that's also an uh, issue with conventional photonic crystals. Uh, when you go down to this so-called valley hole crystals, okay, uh, or, or this so-called woo structure, structures, basically pho topological photonic crystals, they are true photonic crystals with periodicity on the wavelength of light. These things are, at the moment, extremely challenging to fabricate, essentially because you have to create sub-wavelength features and deeply sub-wavelength features. So you have to go in, and it's not just drilling holes. Uh, like, for example, here, you have to be, have the ability to create this small triangular, triangular shapes and other kinds of shape motifs uh, that are smaller than the wavelength of light. So this is a bit challenging, and this is one of the reasons, by the way, that we want when in our collaboration with Qijie, we were so interested in going to terahertz uh, because we know that terahertz, the wavelength is longer, so it's easier to fabricate this triangular uh, patterns, relatively easier anyway, so we have a higher chance of getting it right, uh, basically because the overall length scale of this is increased if you operate at terahertz frequencies rather than at uh, optical frequencies. Okay. And uh, I have another question also. Should uh, the scalability of large systems is limited by scattering mostly. So how do we control the loss uh, due to scattering as well as achieve uh, large scale quantum systems? Yes. So this is one of the major ap possible applications that, that I didn't mention. There are really two uh, possible applications people are exploring. These are not ironclad right now, okay? So we don't know for sure they will work. One of them is topological lasers. The other one is um, using uh, topological photonics for transporting uh, quantum states, uh, quantum optical states. Uh, so the idea here is that if you have a ordinary waveguide let's say on-chip waveguide, you want to do some quantum optics on the chip. Um, as long as you have some kind of structuring, uh, some kind of fabrication defects, uh, you will get localization. Well, you get a few things. You have out-of-plane scattering, okay, which really we can't help really that much with, but you also have in-plane scattering, meaning that you scatter forward or backwards when you hit a defect or sideways. Uh, this in-plane scattering can be very, very problematic if you want to transport a um, qubit or really even a normal white light wave from point A to point B because it gives rise to localization. Uh, after you have trans if, if basically the waveguide modes become localized, they, have become, they decay exponentially uh, away from their source. Uh, and this can happen even without out of plane scattering. It's just because of the back, small, small bounce get back reflected at every step. And then you get exponential decay along the, the waveguide channel. Uh, but the topological photonics can help with that. Uh, it, 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 topological states are very resistant to in plane scattering. Uh, so people are actively looking into this. Uh, the question, of course, is that uh, are you able to overcome the out of plane scattering? Because these topological, usually these topological structures require a lot, quite a lot of fabrication. And the more patterning you do, the higher the risk that you will start doing out of plane losses. So that then you get an exponential decay, not because of in plane localization, but because your light is leaving the chip out, to, out, out of plane. But it's a big topic. I, I, I can't really uh, cover all the details in, in this uh, short discussion. All right, so Prof Chong, for the NSC GSC side, we have uh, two uh, more generic questions. So for the first question, actually, will be more on the material uh, point of view. Mm. So for instance, uh, currently right now, is there any like a new materials that's actually being developed right now for topological photonics? Like whether, like in that case, uh, the structural difference of this material actually uh, right. affects all these uh, quantum mechanisms? Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so the focus on the focus so far has been on using normal materials, meaning dielectrics, you know, silicon, silicon nitride, uh, 
at least for nanophotonics, for, for the um, microwave is just metals, right? Which are perfect conductors at uh, microwave frequencies. Uh, so people have paid relatively less attention to uh, using novel materials. Uh, that said, uh, people now are exploring it in a few, uh, this, this direction from a few different points of view. Uh, one of them is that we want to create uh, topological photonic uh, devices that can be modulated. So for example, if you come with a pump, uh, you optically pump this, and then let's say initially your photonic H state goes this way, but now you pump it, it, it bends, for example, that'll be kind of cool, right? You kind of like optical, but, but to do this, you need uh, basically optically active materials. Uh, rather than the boring dielectrics that you've been playing with so far. So people are exploring things like using chalcogenides and materials like that to fabricate this uh, photonic uh, topological insulators. Uh, people also are looking at it from the polariton point of view. So something which I haven't talked at all about is that uh, people actually can realize what are called topological polaritonics. And there, there's quite a lot of work that has to be done about having just the right materials to support this, uh, this kind of polaritons. Um, so that, that there is uh, also, you know, some people that have been exploring the idea of kind of hybridizing electronic uh, topology and photonic topology. I don't really know that much about it. It's not something that seems very close to realization. Uh, basically because the length scales are much too different. Uh, so basically, you know, electronic band structure is at, you know, like um, uh, atomic scale, whereas photonic band structure is much larger than micron scale. So it doesn't seem to be really very fruitful way of marrying the two so that you kind of have a hybrid, you know, topological insulator and uh, photonic topological insulator. Uh, but, uh, you know, you know, I, but anyway, there are lots of ideas. People are exploring this, uh, in, in different directions. Yeah. Then, uh, sorry, Bob Tong. Okay. So, uh, there is another question, a bit more generic in that case. So sure. since we're on the topic on topological lasers and right now 5G is a mixed in thing and telecommunications is in thing. So how is this being like any communication? It's a next in thing where, whereby we assemble, uh, example like your work for that, uh, Optic fibers are using lasers, all this. So, how in that case will properly uh, logical lasers have an implication on telecommunications in the near future? Yeah, I mean, so this was the idea that um, my colleague Ranjan Singh at SPMS is uh, exploring. So, I think I can give you his pitch, okay, uh, which, which kind of makes sense to me, which is that um, let's say wireless communications, uh, if you go beyond 5G, you go to 6G telecommunications, eventually you're gonna uh, have to go to shorter and shorter wavelengths just because you want to get the bit rate up, right? So you want to get a bit rate up, you go to shorter wavelengths, you're gonna go from uh, kind of a short wavelength microwaves to terahertz waves. And once you do that, you're gonna to need to build this whole ecosystem of uh, devices that can take terahertz waves uh, put them on the chip, and then it moves around on the chip, and then you do various kinds of manipulations on it, with length multiplexing and so forth. You know, signal various sorts of signal processing done on the chip before then you broadcast this. Okay, so you need an ecosystem of terahertz chips, and then the argument is that uh, with this photonic topological insulators, this could help, basically because uh, if you want to carry terahertz waves from one point to another point on the chip. You want to do this with as little scattering losses as possible, as little localization or, you know, uh, input, uh, basically degradation of the signal due to fabrication imperfections as possible. And for this, uh, Valley Hall uh, designs and other sorts of photonic crystal designs do appear to be quite uh, advantageous, okay? Uh, Again, you know, this is uh, something that's being explored. Uh, this seems to make sense to me, and I, I obviously hope that it will, you know, uh, prove to be a lasting piece of technology. Uh, but this is very much under exploration right now. 
Okay, we'll perform things for inside. All right, yeah. so hopefully we will begin the Q&A session and we'll actually take uh, uh, questions for the participants right now. So currently on the list is uh, Tang Hong Po. Uh, if you're around, okay, is it possible for you to unmute, unmute your mic so that you can ask uh, Prof Chong your question? Yeah, just give me a minute. Eh? Oh, okay. Unfortunately, I think uh, Chang Kong Po is not around already. Yeah, so it's okay, Prof. I'll just uh, ask his question. So his question actually is what's the main difference between topological lasers and conventional lasers? Yeah, there's nothing on, on the lasing side. There's nothing different in the sense that we are not inventing a new type of uh, laser medium in the way that a quantum cascade laser is different from a semiconductor diode laser, right? So we are just using some kind of existing laser technology. And then instead of having the laser, for example, the laser light goes around in a ring, for example, or it bounces back and forth within a cavity, like a ridge cavity, or back, bounce back and forth between two distributed back, back reflectors, DBRs. Instead, we pattern the laser uh, in some way. So it could be, you take the laser, you create this coupled resonator uh, lattice, lattice of coupled resonators, or you take the same kind of laser medium and you create this photonic crystal, mm -hmm. this belly hole like photonic crystal, triangular lattice of triangles. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you look at the laser emission from that. So uh, this, by the way, gives us a way of comparing to see what difference this topological uh, design provides. Because for example, you can take the same exact same quantum cascade laser chip where we created this uh, topological quantum cascade laser and we, elsewhere in the chip, we create a conventional photonic crystal laser that is non-topological. So it try to go, so I, I didn't show it here, but let, let's say you have, you try to create a, photonic crystal defect waveguide and you arrange it in a corner. So exactly the same shape and size uh, as this uh, uh, topological design. And you ask yourself, what is the laser emission pattern that you see uh, or the laser spectrum that you see? Uh, it looks like this, it's completely irregular spacing. So the very different behaviors between the uh, topological uh, pattern and the non-topological pattern tells us that the, the topological edge states are doing something special in, uh, in this uh, topological laser. But the, the way that they are lasing, this quantum cascade laser or whatever other laser medium we're using is exactly the same. So we are not doing anything different in terms of the, 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 the lasing mechanism, the lasing action. Okay, it's basically you are just manipulating the uh, optical modes in which the lasing takes place. Yeah, thanks a lot. Okay, just give me a moment. We have another question from one of the participants. Okay. Yeah, let me just try to get him on so that he can, uh, yeah, so we get him to yeah, share his uh, webcam and ask you his question. Yeah, just give him a minute or so. Okay. Yeah, okay, he's here. So we have a uh, Zhang, uh, Zhang Pei uh, Yu, so he will have, and I'll let him uh, ask his question and at the same time hopefully he will show his uh, his uh, webcam so that we can be more interactive. Yeah. So, uh, uh, can you yeah. yeah, we can hear you. Sorry, one question. Uh, one second. Yeah, I'm just curious, uh, does the gauss Bonnet theorem come in useful for you in any way uh, when you calculate the chain number? If so, are there any complex generalizations that you find useful in your line of work? Yeah, uh, thanks for the question. Uh, it turns out that I kind of kind of did a bit of sleight of hand. Okay, so the Gauss Bonnet theorem is a theorem basically that counts the number of holes in a shape. 
right? Like, like for example, here, the genus is zero in the, of a sphere. If you have a genus is one if you have a torus. Uh, we don't actually use the gauss bonnet theorem for calculating the churn number, which is the main, the first topological invariant that people discovered for two-dimensional band structures. It is a different, uh, it's not the genus, it is something called the churn number. The way you calculate it is basically using something called the Berry connection. So basically, the way, way of thinking about this is the following. Okay, so you have this uh, uh, block bands. They are indexed by a band index n and a uh, vector k, which is defined uh, in the Brillouin zone. Okay. Uh, well, so so k is just think of it as a two-dimensional vector. So for each. So uh, just suppose you keep n fixed and you just let k vary. So what this is saying is that for every two-dimensional vector k, you have a vector, which is nk. This vector is the state vector of the quantum system, right? So you have a two-dimensional, uh, so you have a vector that's indexed by a two-dimensional vector. Now it turns out that uh, this, this uh, state vectors have a phase degree of freedom associated with them. Uh, that's arbitrary in some sense, meaning that uh, you, for example, this Schrodinger equation, h psi is equal to e psi, right? If you multiply psi by a phase e to the i phi, it still satisfies the same Schrodinger equation, okay? So there's a phase degree of freedom, but it turns out that uh, if you look at this phase very, very carefully, okay? Uh, this phase can, can can contain singularities that cannot be uh, eliminated when you manipulate the system in various ways. You do what's called a gauge transformation. So the churn number is basically a way of counting the number of vortices in this phase field. So if you have a two-dimensional plane, everywhere in that plane you define a phase, there are some points where you have a vortex. And the churn number is basically to cut a long story short, a way of counting the, the vortices. So it, it is a topological invariant. It's not exactly the same as the familiar topological invariant called the genus, which you use to classify shapes. But it's still a same kind of object in the sense that it cannot change uh, uh, continuously. It has to be an integer. I see. So in that case, would you see the winding number? It's more appropriate to see it as a winding number uh, around yeah. the whole yeah. Oh, okay, okay, right. Uh, yes, thank, thank you. Winding numbers are topological invariants as well. Yeah. I see. Okay. And you only integrate over this uh, one Brillouin zone. That's right, the first Brillouin zone. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, okay, yeah, uh, thank you very much. Sure, no problem. Okay, thank you, Phil. Yeah. All right, so for the audience, is there any other questions? Okay, if not, then, uh, Pop Chong, I still got another question for you. Yeah. Sure. Okay, so because uh, right now you mentioned about topological uh, photonics, right? Then also because of all this topological structure and coming to like right now smart materials and thing, is sure. there a way that right now that we can convert like you know like a uh, shape memory topological state that whereby under certain condition like heat or uh, it would change its uh, topological topological shape and thus its properties? Yeah, that's um, that's a good question. I I I I honestly don't know. Um, I mean, there are people that kind of look at, yeah, I mean, as you say, shape memory, structures, devices that where you kind of have two different phases, right? And then mm -hmm. you, you have one phase that has certain properties and another phase that has completely different properties, uh, often not really topological in nature, right? Mm -hmm. So you could certainly... Yeah, I would think about it. I mean, there are people that, in some sense, you're, you're, yeah, okay, there are already people that talk about um, tunable topological photonics. So you have some kind of device, right? Um, and then if you, uh, if you uh, modulate it one way, it is a conventional photonic insulator, a conventional photonic uh, crystal. If you manipulate it, a different way you, you pump it or whatever it is a topological insulator uh, so it carries photonic currents around this edge so you have some kind of smart material where somehow if you pump it it remains as a photonic topological insulator it still can do that and then you have to you know 
uh, over pump it and then you bring it back. So that's some kind of memory that would be really cool. Uh, I, I would, I mean, if you have an idea about how to do this, yeah, feel free to, we can chat after this. Yeah. So far people, the kind of stuff that people have talked about for modulating photonic topological insulators. From what I know, I don't, uh, maybe, uh, maybe somebody has published about this, I don't know, but to my knowledge, it's, it's been reversible. It's an optical pump, and we take away the pump, it goes back to its original uh, configuration. Uh, I see. Okay, then from there, another thing is that uh, given that the advancements in 3D printing right now uh, is also in thing for advanced uh, yeah. uh, additive manufacturing, yeah. so would it be possible to uh, do additive manufacturing for uh, topological photonics? Well, uh, you, the trouble with using this for topological photonics is if you want to work at optical frequencies, uh, 3D is not quite there yet. You can't do nanofabrication with 3D printing. Okay. Uh, and then if you want to work at microwave frequencies, usually you want much higher dielectric materials than what you can handle with uh, 3D printing. But uh, there are people can do metal 3D printing now, and this is actually proving to be an increasingly uh, uh, useful way of creating microwave uh, devices. So, for example, this three-dimensional topological insulator that Ihao worked on, uh, this was done using PCB fabrication, you know, uh, but stuff like that can be, you, you, could, you could use metal 3D printing to do something similar. Uh, so conventional 3D printing on resins uh, and polymers uh, have proven to be amazingly helpful, not in the topological photonics context, but for topological acoustics, which I barely have time to talk about. Uh, and I don't have anything on my slide, but basically uh, some people in Pilot's lab have done a lot of work in um, creating this very complicated uh, acoustic structures, essentially using 3D printing. And this is really, they, they, they've kind of gotten a lot of knowledge out of this technique. It's cheap, it is uh, accurate, and uh, it's a great way of creating acoustic uh, crystals. So for example, this, uh, uh, this Nature Materials paper where they created this first, ex uh, you know, so-called zero quadruple moment, higher order topological insulators. This was done using a 3D printed acoustic structure. Okay. Uh, okay. All right. Thank you, Prof. Chong. Yeah, that's actually quite insightful. I think uh, we will just uh, post a session for here. So, Thank Prof. Chong, once again, thanks a lot for all the insight, insight that we have uh, for today. That's a very yeah. wonderful uh, webinar and also a special yeah. QA session. I learned quite a okay, lot. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Yeah, so, so on behalf of you, I thank all the audience who are coming along. Uh, but for the audience, before you leave, there's actually a feedback uh, session. So actually, I'd like to invite Chris to uh, show the holding slide. So there is a QR code at the end for you to scan and give us your feedback. At the same time, if any one of you guys need uh, an announcement for your participation for today, please also let us know in, in the feedback form. Yeah. Mm -hmm. With that, then I'll just to thank everyone once again. And uh, thank you for your time. And I uh, hope everyone will have a good lunch and have a good day. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Chong.